So, how many people know the Adam and Eve story? How many people have been tortured by the Adam and Eve story? Right? It's like you think of the Adam and Eve story, and the traditional way of looking at it outside of New Thought is they screwed up, they had kids, and we're like their great, 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 great grandkids. Therefore, we're screwed up too. Therefore, we're condemned. We need a redeemer, someone to get us past our, our stuff. Well, I'm sorry. I, I can't do it. I tried. It never felt right. And over the years, I came up with this thing called the real you conversation and came to know the Adam and Eve story for what I believe the writers of that story intended for us to have. So here's the basics of the Adam and Eve story. You got Adam, you got Eve, God makes them. God creates the Garden of Eden, creates Adam, then creates Eve and says, hey guys, I'm God, you're Adam, you're Eve, welcome to the Garden. I made all of this just for you. It's perfect. The ground here is so soft, you don't even need a bed to lie down on. The weather here is so perfect, you don't even need to wear clothes. Everything is perfect here. And I made all of this just for you. All the food you could ever want, all the water you could ever want to drink, it's all here for you. Perfect. I took great care to make it just for you. One catch in the perfection, however. See that tree over there? Stay away from the tree, okay? That tree contains the knowledge of good and evil. Stay away from the tree. All of this is yours, but don't go near the tree, okay? Please, just stay away from the tree. Well, we know what happened, okay? There's a snake that came in, because, you know, a, little, a cute little puppy talking, you know, wouldn't, it, wouldn't have been nearly as effective or scary. So they have this snake that slithers around, and he talks to Eve, because you've got to talk to Eve first to convince Adam, because the, you know, Judeo-Christian patriarchy, the, the guys are always right, and it's always the woman's fault, right? That's just the way that works. So the snake comes in and says, hey, Eve, go ahead, you can try the tree. And Eve said, oh, no, no, it's all right. So she convinces Adam, hey, Adam, try some of the stuff off the tree. Oh, but we were told, no, nah, don't worry about it, it'll be all right. So she, next thing you know, Adam has a, a bite of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and suddenly Adam has the knowledge of good and evil. And he says, hey, Eve, this stuff's pretty good. Why don't you try some? So Eve has a bite of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then she has the knowledge of good and evil. Next thing you know, they both have the knowledge of good and evil. And they look down and they say, we're not wearing any clothes. Is that good or evil? Ooh, must be evil. We better cover ourselves. So they grab some fig leaves or whatever was, whatever was available in the moment. And they realize, oh, wait a minute. We disobeyed God's only thing that he gave us to do. We're in big trouble. We better go hide. So they go hide behind a bush, and about that time, God comes out because God sees everything because God's God. And he says, hey, Adam, Eve, how's the first five minutes in the garden going? And, whoa, she made me do this, and I feel bad, and now we're cold, and oh, we're bad. Can, can, can you hear the guilt trip? The whole conditional situation unconditional love of God out the window. They blew it so much for conditions, right? Or unconditional love. Now, for me, unconditional love would mean that without condition, God's going to love us. So what's all this stuff about? Well, they did that however many gazillion years ago, and we're still having to pay the price on that? Sounds like a guilt trip to me. So let's be with that for a second. Now, what is the story really about? What God was trying to tell the people was stay away from this tree, which will give you the knowledge of good and evil. What I believe they were saying was keep the brain out of the way because the brain is what discerns good and evil, right and wrong, up and down, you and me, us and them, Democrat, Republican. Pick, pick a category. And that's what the brain does. The brain's job is to store information and save it for later use, right? That's what the brain does. It's like the memory bank. It's like a hard drive in a computer. I don't know how techy some of you guys are. I'm not a tech guy, but 
the way I understand it, a hard drive works because it has all these little millions of sectors that you can drop pieces of information into, and then the computer grabs that and uses it as needed. Well, that's what the brain does. But the way the brain does that is by separating everything from everything else so that it can save it for later. The brain is inherently divisive. If we're letting this run the show, there can only be good, evil, right, wrong, up, down, you, me. Separation of us from each other. Separation of us from God, from spirit, from the oneness. How many people here have heard the talk about oneness, right? It's a new thought congregation. Of course you know about we're all one in the spirit. We're all one in the universe. This cannot really perceive that. It can know it like a concept, but it can't know it as reality. We have to drop down to here for that. The heart unites. The heart knows oneness. We can feel each other's energy when we're tuned into here. The best we can do here is have a thought about it. We can talk and connect. We can make eye contact. And we can feel the other person's presence. You know the expression, the eyes are the windows to the soul. If you're looking into someone's eyes, you can feel them. Unless you're stuck here. Get out of your head. How many people have heard get out of your head? How many people kind of live in their head most of the time? Okay. The brain has to separate. The brain has to compare something to something else to even begin to know it as a thing. Now, the thing about the comparison is that it, it puts everything into a category. Nothing is really all it is in its fullness because the brain's trying to categorize it. It's inherently limiting. That's what the brain does. Now, Mark Twain, who's one of my heroes, when I come to Santa Fe and go down Canyon Road, there's a, a, a sculpture of Mark Twain sitting there. I, I, I love sitting there. Hey, man, how you doing here? He never answers, but, you know, it's the way it goes. So the brain has to compare everything to everything else. Twain said, comparison is the death of joy. I say, awareness is the death of comparison. In the awareness, not that we have, but in the awareness that we are, we can know oneness. We can know the fullness of each other. We can know how we're all connected, how it all comes together. We may not know the fullness of how it all happens, but we can be in the flow of it. And we can feel that presence. We can feel the chills and the hair raising on our arm, and we know something's happening. And we can feel that. How do you get there? How do you get to that place? Well, if you look at any issue, any issue, I don't care what the upset, what the discouragement, discontent, dissatisfaction might be, there's always a point A, which is what's so, and a point B, which is what I prefer instead of point A. Any issue, any dissatisfaction has a what's so and what I'd prefer instead. The thing is, we need to work with, why is that a preference? Why is that an, un an unfulfilled expectation? What is it that we're really seeking? Because the upset doesn't lie in what's so. The upset always lies in what we're thinking and who we're being about what's so. We can't change what's so, but we can always shift who we're being about it. So the Adam and Eve story, I believe, was the original writers intending to say, don't let the brain run the show. Let the heart run the show. But that's not how we operate. So, for example, if this is running the show, what does this know better than anything? It knows you, your history, every thought, every thought about the thought, every thought about the thought about the thought, everything you've ever thought about, every thought and everything that's ever happened to you. And it knows that. It stored all of that. Every experience you've ever had is in there. 
What does it do with it? It compares it to everything else. Is there any satisfaction available in that? Maybe for a moment. Ooh, I wanted to have $100. Now I got $100. I'd rather have $200. Oh, I got a million dollars. I think I'd rather have $2 million. I got this car. Yeah, but I wish it had these tires. Whatever it is, the brain's going to make something to compare something to something else. Which is why Twain said comparison's the death of joy. Nothing is ever going to be enough. Are you ever enough? Right? In your heart, in the knowing of your divinity, which is bigger than anything, you know you're enough. But when this is in charge, I wish I was a little taller. I wish my nose was straight. I wish I didn't have some of these little veins on my nose. I wish I hadn't scratched my hand so that if anyone's looking, they're going to get distracted from what I'm really trying to say because they're looking at a cut on my hand. How ridiculous does that sound? And yet this is what we do. Anytime you look at, okay, could this change? Could that change? Could this be better? Yeah. Does it matter? No. Not really. But this is what we do. We judge ourselves on how much money we make. Where do we live? How nice is the place we live in? How, how nice is the furniture in our place? Do I have enough money in savings? What kind of car do I drive? Then you can look around and compare you to the other folk. Well, what kind of car do they drive? What kind of house do they live in? How much money must they make? There's all these comparisons going on all day. And it's all a judgment. And it's all nothing but a brain-generated bunch of stuff. I'm in a unity congregation, so I can't say the word I'd really, really rather use. But in that stuff, we can sprinkle a little wisdom and a little experience and a little awareness on this stuff, mix all that in, and turn it into spiritual compost. Is there anything healthier in your garden than compost? And it comes from the stuff of whatever, grass, leaves, poop, whatever, right? But when we can mix all of that together, it becomes the richest stuff there is in our garden. That's what we have available to us. Not all of this, but the awareness of how it all comes together. We can get past the judgments of ourselves. We can get past the judgments of others. If we're pointing in Self-hatred, self-loathing, dissatisfaction with everything. How many people are happy with every single thought they have? Go on. If you raise your hand, I know you're lying. Okay? But that's the point, right? You can't stop this. From the moment you popped out of your mom, the doctor slapped you on the butt, you took your first breath, and you're looking around all the lights and people laughing and crying and whatever they're doing, your brain's been in hyper overdrive ever since. And because it knows everything about us, we think that's us. But it's not. It's just our brain pumping out thought. Our stomach pumps stomach acid. Our heart pumps blood. Our brains pump out thought. It's just another bodily organ doing what it does. But until we can step back and notice that there's a brain that's going 1,000 miles an hour all day, we can stop and step back from that with what I call the real you and notice the brain chatter. And then this thing can be moving around 1,000 miles an hour, but guess what? This is in stillness, watching this move 1,000 miles an hour. Well, how do we get to the stillness? By noticing what's not still. It's totally counterintuitive, but when we're noticing this, we're actually here noticing this. It's this huge paradox, but when you are being the noticer, you're in stillness watching what's not still. And the way you get there is by noticing what's not still. And in this stillness, we can receive what's available. Where's God? It's a trick question. In there, where else is God? Everywhere, in everything. Is there anywhere God's not? So if God is everywhere in everything, where does God have to go? Nowhere, because God's already everywhere. Therefore, God must be operating in stillness. So how do we access that place where God is? By noticing what's not that. It's so simple, but it is not easy. 
because we have this that we think is real. You're not your brain. You're not the bodily stuff going on in the body. You're not even your life circumstances. You're the noticer of all of that. Here, you judge yourself, you judge others. You separate yourself from others. If I'm look, we've already talked about the stuff that happens when you're in here, but how about when you're looking out in the world around you from here and not from here? Well, there's someone, oh, I'll just give you some examples. Notice where your brain goes when I speak the following words. Gay. Black. Red, Arab, Muslim, Christian, Jew, redhead, baldhead, big nose, right? Your brain's got all these thoughts about everything that we perceive out there and then process through here. Is this ever really correct? Sometimes. But can it possibly know the oneness and the connection that's available to everyone and everything? I don't think so. We've got to drop down into here. If we can live more from here, this has less control over everything. Look around the world. Look at the justifications, the institutionalized justifications of hate, of separation, of not giving... Ah, there's a, how about poor people? How many people say, oh, he doesn't have to be poor. He could do, right? He doesn't have to be sick. Or how about the new age, new thought, new wisdom twisted around and stuff? Well, oh, in the divine perfection, everything's fine. So if you have an illness, you need to, no, 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 no. I'm a holistic healer. I know that our body is a physical representation of our thoughts and emotions and our spiritual makeup. Therefore, if I'm sick, I must be, is that wrong? Or is it just a what's so? But this is going to judge it as right wrong. How many, I mean, you look at the Saudis in the, Gemin, in the Yemenis, genocide of the Yemeni people, South African apartheid. I'm not going to get political. I grew up Jewish, so I'm very strongly in favor of Israel, but I'm not a big fan of where Israel is going right now with their treatment of the Palestinians. Well, the Palestinians did this. It sounds like a bunch of four-year-olds. Well, they started it. No, well, they do this. And, it, and everybody uses that to justify separation, to justify inhumane treatment of a fellow human soul. We're all connected in the oneness. And yet, I grew up Jewish. You don't think I heard about Hitler and the Holocaust? The Jews were scapegoated, but no one talks about the millions of gay people that were killed, the millions of Christians that were killed. Hitler was responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of people. And then the Russians gave 25 million lives and helped drain Hitler's resources and helped end the war, and now we're hating the Russians, and they're hating us. And it's like, can we just drop the history? I think it's kind of a guy thing, too. I think it's part of a patriarchy thing, a macho thing. Folks, can we just love each other? Can we drop out of this and down to here? If we can do that, life gets better. The way you step back from this is by noticing that. Stay in the stillness. Stay in the love. Stay in the awareness, not that we have, but the awareness that we are. And then we can stand in the oneness. And there is no right thing or wrong thing. There's only love. Anything that's not love is illusion. Stay in the love. Stay here. And all is better. Thank you.